Right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is JP Zagrant. I'm uh, at the LSE in the Finance Department, and together with John Danielson, I'm running the Systemic Risk Center, and uh, we are very happy to have Ian Golding here uh, present his book and then sign book copies later on after the event. The Systemic Risk Center has as its mission to understand systemic risk, especially in finance and economics. Uh, we try to achieve this through research and public events such as this one here, and we sort of try to become, or maybe are, the go-to place for systemic risk research and policy-relevant research at that. And therefore, when because we are an interdisciplinary center as well, we have law, we have computer science, we have political science on top of economics and finance and so forth. And when Ian Golding's new book came out, it was squarely in that interdisciplinary sort of frame of mind, trying to understand systemic risk from a broader perspective. In his perspective, globalization is the angle that he chose to write this book in. Is I think the fourth book in the series on globalization, or the fifth one, and probably not the last one uh, on on this topic. Uh, so The Butterfly Defect uh, is the book that will be launched here and, and presented in sort of 50 minutes. And afterwards, I asked Danny Quar to comment uh, uh, on the book. Danny looks like he just came from his graduate studies, but he's been here for like 25 <laughs> years or something like this. And he, he, more than everybody else, knows a lot about these questions. There is a hashtag I have to announce. The hashtag is L so hashtag LSESRC, like Systemic Risk Center. And after Danny's 15, 20 minutes comments on the book, I hope you read the book because his name appears as an endorser on the back of the book, so we'll test him. <laughs> <laughs> on, on that as well. Uh, I would like you to ask lots of questions and so forth, and we try to be done by 8 o'clock. Let me present the speakers to you. Uh, so Ian Golding, he's here quite often. He presented in this room more often than I have presented in this room. And uh, that is partly because he writes lots of books, but partly because he's a great presenter and we would like to have him back. And the fact he has an MSc degree from LSE has, of course, nothing to do uh, with that frequency here. He is a professor of globalization and development at the University of Oxford, and he's the director of the Oxford Martin School at, uh, at Oxford. His CV is very long and very accomplished. That's why he's here. So he was a vice president of the World Bank. Prior to that, he was the bank's director for, of development policy. He also uh, was a chief executive from 1996 to 2001 and managing director of the Development Bank of Southern Africa, where he was uh, an advisor to President Mandela. He, I think in that time, I read in your CV, I'm not sure it's true, that you were the finance director for the South Africa's Olympic bid. I, yeah. uh, maybe that was the one we won, in which case I'm happy that not all of Ian's ventures uh, end <laughs> in happiness. Prior to that, he held senior positions at EBRD and the OECD. And um, he has a BA and a BSc from the University of Cape Town, an MSc from the LSE, as I mentioned, an MA and doctorate from the University of uh, Oxford. He also had right recognitions. He was knighted by the French government, and he was nominated Global Leader of Tomorrow by the World Economic Forum. Danny, uh, he's a professor at LSE of Economics and International Development. He's a director of the Saw Seahawk Southeast Asia Center. And prior to that, he was the QI professor. He was the co-director of LSE Global Governance, the QI Research Program, and so forth and so forth. And he came here after uh, a stint as professor at MIT. Ian, please, 15 minutes. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be uh, back at LSE. And uh, thanks very much, Jean-Pierre. It's uh, also a pleasure to know that LSE has established uh, this risk center, uh, which really is much needed, as uh, I hope my talk will, will illustrate. And I was so delighted that my friend Danny uh, has agreed to be the commentator. Um, and given that he said a nice thing about me, uh, about the book, I, it's relaxed me because uh, I think he's a friend. Uh, so uh, anything he says now will just be on top of, of his already very kind words. But thank you for both agreeing to be. And thanks to all for coming out on a very cold um, full moon evening. So this is sort of about my, my bad news talk. This is the witch's talk. Uh, most of what I think about uh, is trying to find in globalization policies which will lead to poverty reduction uh, and huge achievements. And this is really my nightmares uh, about globalization and how we manage them. So uh, it's the other side 
of uh, what I have written about. And it really draws quite extensively on the work of the Oxford Martin School. The Oxford Martin School, uh, which I'm the dean of in Oxford, is a group of about 350 people now working across the frontiers of medicine, uh, physical and life sciences, social sciences and humanities, interdisciplinary teams working on everything from finance to neuroscience, uh, pandemics, climate change, etc. And as we talk across the school and think about what the challenges are, many of those are those that emerge um, in this book. The, the overriding sense I have of the time we live in is this most extraordinary phenomena of the walls coming down. 25 years ago uh, in Berlin, but around the world all the time. Information, people, ideas, products, services, traveling more rapidly than any time in history. And this has brought extraordinary changes, not least those in my life, which have allowed me to go from exile uh, from South Africa, when I came here to LSE, in fact, um, back to become a President Mandela's economic advisor. What I thought was the result of the struggle of the South African people, and of course it was, I now realize would not have happened if the Berlin Wall had not come down. If politics had not changed fundamentally, the Cold War had not ended, uh, and through that the struggle for the future of, amongst other places, South Africa. So this process of change ripples, and it ripples from the other side of the world into our lives in dramatic and unexpected ways, and of course it continues. And we see in the Arab Spring a further iteration of this process of transformation which is more rapid and what the Arab Spring and not least the developments in ISIS demonstrate and in Egypt is that this is not a one-way street. This is not about more and more openness and more and more connectivity. This is about more uncertainty, more instability. It's a roller coaster. It's a more rapid pace of change and so that the only certainty is the dynamic, is this huge transformational whirlwind that we are caught up in in every aspect of our lives. Now, most of this is good news, and that's the reason why, over the same period of time, there are two billion more people on the planet. It's because good ideas have traveled. Good ideas, like washing your hands, prevents contagious diseases, like smoking kills you, like wear a condom if you don't want to get HIV AIDS. These are ideas that have traveled around the world, but also, also technologies have traveled, like vaccines, like new cures for cancer. And that's why there are two billion more people on the planet, because we are le leading longer, healthier lives around the world, with two exceptions, Southern Africa because of HIV AIDS and Russia for a whole different set of reasons. But those are the exceptions. Life expectancy around the world is improving. So it's a time which has demonstrated that globalization can bring enormous benefits. And for many people, life expectancy is the easiest measure of well-being. How long are you going to live for? And that's improved over this period of time, on average for the world, by around 20 years. It took from the Stone Age the 1980s to get an average 20-year increase in life expectancy. So this process works, and it works on aggregate to improve people's lives. But aggregates mask a lot. The other fundamental difference, of course, is it's not only about physical connectivity. For the first time in history, the pace and the spread of virtual connectivity has become global. The Gutenberg Press did a similar thing because then it transformed ideas from being simply things that monasteries and monks had an interest in to things that ordinary people did. But this is different. So we move from a world of about 1.5 billion literate people in the 1970s to a world of about 5 billion literate people now. Three and a half times, 3.5 3 billion more people connected, literate, engaged. Quite extraordinary. And because it's a virtual nervous system, it means the pulse of the world is now felt 
in energy, in innovation, in ideas, and of course in transactions. A virtual and a physical. This is airline traffic around the world with the bars just reflecting the depth. So any metric you look at shows this transformation over this period of time. This is world air and world air freight carried. And you see this rise from the 1980s, very steep rise. And this is another way of thinking about the same sort of new connectivity. This is panels reflecting financial integration, barriers to financial integration. And the blue lines are restrictiveness <coughs> measures, and the red lines are openness measures. And you see openness improving, restrictiveness going down around the world, and you see emerging markets lagging behind the advanced economies in this respect. This is another way of thinking about the same sort of phenomenon, because we at LSE and I'm in economics, I look at a lot of financial flows. Now this is foreign direct investment, remittances, what migrants send back, ODAs, aid flows, and portfolios, investment is bond and equity flows. And you see these being relatively stable and flat until about 1990, and then much higher orders of magnitude, but also, crucially, much more unstable after 1990. Any measure you look at of flows will show these sorts of patterns. Much higher levels, but also higher levels of instability in this world, which I call the world of globalization. Now, you can call it whatever you want, and globalization is a much abused term, but for me it means integration, connectivity, that's what the term means. It doesn't mean a whole lot of other things that some people uh, mean it to be. This is another way of thinking about the same sort of transformation, and this is simply trade flows merchandise trade flows between the different regions of the world. And again, you see this transformational period from the late 80s, 90s. Of course, some of the actors, like China, really just coming in. And all of these, I'm sorry, are just graphs that are in and graphics that are in the book, so I'm only presenting them soon. Now, in this, it's not simply that the flows are at much higher levels. There are many, many new actors as well. China coming in, but many, many others. And within these countries, a much more complex dynamic of manufacturing and supply chain and integration. And this is what's reflected in this, where you get a depiction of the transformation just from 1960 to 2000 of trade flows, who the actors are, how many products come in, etc. And when I, a little bit later in the talk, I'll give you another graphic, which is another way of thinking about that, which is the supply chain dimension to it. What does this mean? This means that transformation of global production and incomes around the world. The workers, the factories of the world have moved. They've grown in number, but they've moved in location. And so you have this extraordinary phenomenon of emerging markets, transformation of their contribution to global growth, with well over two-thirds of global economic activity now already in emerging markets and about 80% predicted for 2030. So where things happen, where they are produced, and where they are consumed transforms. And with that, this extraordinary phenomena of 3.5 billion middle-class consumers just in Asia, and about 4 billion around the world. Now, part of what drives the concern on the butterfly defect is, is this sustainable? When you look at this period in the long sweep of history, the last 2,000 years, you get this most extraordinary thing. Population growth, that's arithmetic, the left-hand axis. Income growth, that's exponential, the right-hand axis. And you get income growth exceeding population growth, even though population growth has never been as rapid. There was a period about 1,000 years ago when income growth exceeded population growth, but population growth was relatively flat at that time. And that period, like this period, was a period of globalization. That was a period when Asia and Europe met each other, and ideas were swapped that had taken millennia to develop in those respective regions. But this is turbocharged swapping of ideas. This is rapid churn, 
Schumpeterian growth at levels that Schumpeter could never imagine. The question, of course, is, is this sustainable? Is this a trend which is manageable? And when I think about this, I worry about the systemic underpinnings. And by systemic, I mean those factors which spill over national borders or sectors. Risk is a very old concept. It's a well-documented and well-researched and written about concept. But what's different between systemic risk and other forms of risk is this cascading overflow nature. That it's not confined to one sector, household risk, auto risk or finance risk, and it's not confined to one place, the UK, or even a locality within the UK. So what do I worry about? Well, one very clear phenomenon is that the process of globalization, integration, connectivity, call it what you will, has been associated with widening inequality. While the walls have gone down within, between societies, within societies, the walls are going up everywhere. This is OECD data, which is slightly out of date, because actually even this, these small panels on the right, which no, didn't show inequality when this was done, now do. <coughs> Every country in the world is showing rising inequality. This leads, as I'll come back to in conclusion, to all sorts of difficulties. It means that the benefits of globalization are highly differentiated. For those that are in the right place at the right time, with the right skills, the right housing mobility, the right attitudes, the right flexibility, they can get on the globalization train and they can move very fast. But for those that are trapped with skill sets or localities or attitudes or ages, or whatever it is, that don't allow them to benefit, they are left further and further behind. Does this matter and why does it matter? It matters profoundly because our societies are losing social cohesion. Because people do not feel that this process is beneficial to them in increasing numbers. And it's not. If you are one of the many unemployed in the south of Europe, not least in Greece, it's not surprising that you feel that globalization is not working for you. And this is true of people around the world. I'll come back to this point. When you look as well at some of the factors that underlie this, you begin to see the explanations. For example, the very differential take-up of the Internet and virtual connectivity by different groups in society. So a lot of these globalization connectivity tools, although everyone raves about the fact that there are more mobile phones in the world than there are people, yes. But if you look at things like broadband connection and other underlying factors, it becomes rapidly <coughs> differentiated. So we see, and this is just a reflection of internet servers and where they are, that people that are not advantaged become further disadvantaged because they lack the tools to integrate. And we'll come back to that. The broader point about globalization is that, unfortunately, not only good things globalize, really bad things globalize as well. So we open our doors, wonderful things come through, new technologies, so we all have the latest phones. This isn't the latest phone, but some of us have the latest phones. New vaccines that will make us healthier, new options, new places to travel to, new foods to eat wonderful people in our society that will increase the rate of innovation and give us academics like the three of us. <laughs> this is all the product of globalization. At the same time, really terrible stuff comes through as well. Pandemics, financial crises, cyber attacks, terrorist attacks, and the unintended consequences of the goods. Climate change, Increasing diabetes, antibiotic resistance. These are the spillover effects 
of our success. And so the question is, can we have the goods without the bads? Can we manage systemic risk, which is endemic in the system, more effectively? And that's why the establishment of the Systemic Risk Center is so important. And that's why thinking about this issue is so important. Because if we are unable to manage it, then we enter a period of history where I believe we will be overwhelmed by the bats of globalization, where we will find that the intended and unintended consequences of our actions increasingly lead to destabilization of the planet, of its ecosystem, and in fact our futures. So this, I believe, is a very important discussion which goes well beyond the narrow confines which unfortunately it tends to be in now. Part of this is as well that we move into this period of the Anthropocene, this period in history where actions of humans shape our future and the planet. A hundred years ago, if someone wanted to screw up the planet, they couldn't do that. Or even one country wanted to screw up the planet, the atmosphere or the oceans or the ecosystems. The means didn't exist. You could kill people in large numbers, and you could kill a lot of nature, but you couldn't destroy the planet. Now, we're entering a period where very small countries can do that. And in fact, we're entering a period where small groups of individuals can do that. This is different. It's a different period because of our capabilities as humans. Capabilities which grow and generate extraordinary potential for good, but also for harm in very different ways. So the past is a very poor guide to the future. As I mentioned, there's a huge literature and industry, the insurance industry, but that sole job is the management of risk. Risk is not a new topic. It's absolutely endemic in all economic activity. Any business person that makes a business decision, us, every day in our lives, we're making risk-weighted decisions with knowingly or unknowingly. But what's different is this integration complexity, the lack of understanding of attribution, and the spillovers. So decisions we make increasingly affect others. And this is a very different story. We're in a market system which is premised on the belief that if we make our own individual rational choices, they will be right for us and implicitly If everyone does the same thing, that's good for society. Well, actually, now, it might be good for us. I can come down from Oxford here and burn some carbon. Uh, I can fly to a conference and burn some carbon. I can take antibiotics when I'm sick. I can do all these things. They're all very good for me. But if 5 billion people do them, they're totally unsustainable. This tension, which is a result of numbers of incomes and interdependencies, leads to very different outcomes. So this sort of analysis where you do probability and impact, you can do it for anything. The problem is the long tail. The unintended, unknown, low probability, high impact events. Now, I don't believe this is the Nicholas Taleb black swan long tail, and many of you might be familiar with that book. The sort of exogenous Things that surprise us. There are things like that, like the Icelandic volcano with an unpronounceable name. Mm-hmm. But those are not what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the things that we cause and do, but don't understand. Like financial crises, like antibiotic resistance, like climate change, like pandemics, etc. These are not black swans. They are simply complex systems which we need to get our heads around. The interdependencies coupled with our rising asset values, our increasingly location in risky spaces, leads to this very rapid rise in not only the value of impact of risk, and this is just a graphic demonstration of how much the financial cost has gone up, but more importantly, the number of natural disasters. Now, I find this term natural disaster actually to be something we should abolish uh, because nothing is natural. 
It is man-made. Uh, increasingly, weather disasters are man-made. But not only is the disaster man-made, where we, how it impacts on us is man-made. The fact that people live in Florida in hurricane-prone areas uh, is man-made. That's because they're crazy insurance policies mm. which lead them to live there. Um, and they'll make, we can come back to this. Now, many would understand that systemic risk is not a new concept. It's thought that perhaps half the British population was killed in an early phase of globalization. Various theories as to how the Black Plague arose, but one of them was that it was a rat coming off a ship into Liverpool Harbour, which is where this plaque is, um, which led to the death of maybe half the British population, an early phase of globalization leading to a pandemic. And of course, we know we killed most of the Native Americans, for example, when we went there. So this idea of transmitting disease is not a new uh, <coughs> idea. What's different uh, is the pace and spread of these things. So swine flu that starts in Mexico City in 160 countries in 30 days. Now, the Emerging Infections Group in the Oxford Martin School has modeled the spread of the swine flu with airline traffic and shown that it exactly replicates it. Indeed, they'll go so far as to say that anything can be anywhere in the world now in 48 hours. Uh, this is a very different sort of pandemic spread to the Black um, Plague or the, the earlier Spanish, so-called Spanish flu, immediately after the First World War, for example. So the vectors of our superconnectivity, in this case airline traffic, and the nodes of our superconnectivity, like JFK or Heathrow, become the centers of dispersal of the bads of globalization as well as the good. And again, the question is, of course, how do you have the good without the bad and the ugly, as it were? Can you have superconnectivity? Can, can we have our cyber systems without always being vulnerable to a cyber attack? Can we have our financial systems without always being vulnerable to a financial crisis? And can we have our incredibly interconnected travel systems without always being vulnerable to a pandemic? How do we do this? And that's just the sectors on their own. But how do we think about the interdependencies? So, for example, I would argue that the biggest risk to the global financial system is likely to arise not from, certainly not from the causes of the past financial crisis, but say <coughs> from a pandemic in Canary Wharf uh, or Wall Street, or a Hurricane Sandy that maybe was slightly bigger and centered slightly differently. So what are the interdependencies between these systems, just like the interdependency we saw between the Icelandic volcano and the whole of European uh, air traffic, and a few weeks ago, the whole of the airline system in the southeast of England coming down because of some cyber event. We don't quite know what it was. Mm. <clears throat> Compounding this complexity is the new power of technologies. And it's very important to remember, as Einstein, of course, uh, observed uh, many times, that all technologies can bring good and can bring bad. They are platforms which can be used for immense good and immense harm. And whether they are used for good and harm and by who depends on our management of these platforms. So DNA sequencing is coming down exponentially in price. This is wonderful. Even our desperately ailing NHS, I believe, within the next 10 years is likely to be able to do individualized DNA sequencing for all of us in the UK. And this will vastly improve all of our health care uh, because it will mean that instead of generic interventions, uh, our GPs actually understand us as individuals. That's good news. The bad news is that crazy people with crazy intentions can sequence measles or smallpox uh, or other things that we don't even know about 
for exponentially declining prices. So how do we have DNA sequencing without WACO, Texas, uh, Armageddonists, or others uh, trying to play silly buggers with us? This is a big challenge, and it relates to some of the challenges we see in other areas. How do we have a cyber system without a cyber hacker trying to bring down uh, a cyber system? The power of individuals and of small groups is greatly enhanced by these new technologies. It enables individuals to do things which previously only nation states could do. And so one of the other spillover consequences of globalization and this extraordinary innovation process that it's unleashed and connectivity is that we are now dealing in a world of a very rapidly rising number of actors that can create systemic risk. Intended, unintended, accidental, whatever. It's very interesting when you look at the threat to banks, because you know, we were all interested in systemic risk, and we think about system risk, but actually the greatest threat to banks has not been from exogenous or outside the bank forces, it's been from individuals within these banks who are weaponized, weaponized in their capacities. So Bearings Bank, which was established in 1756, I think, was brought down uh, by one guy, Nicholas Neeson. A bank that had existed from 1756. Uh, Société Générale, as we know, was almost brought down by Jerome Hevel. J.P. Morgan was almost brought down by the whale trader, and so on. And those are the ones we read about in the papers that we hear about. So that is, to me, emblematic of the fact that individuals in systems have become a source of systemic risk to everyone. Obviously to the institution, but to the extent our savings are with them, to us. So we move into a funny world where the threats are, in my view, decreasingly state actors, although there's some very worrying state actors out there, some of them have nuclear weapons, so these things have not disappeared. But we're in a world of much greater complexity, uncertainty, and number of actors. And I sort of think about this as a world of piracy, just like the pirates in early stages of globalization were able to destabilize countries like the UK. Uh, and their trading routes. Uh, big countries were seemingly powerless against the Johnny Depps of the 1700s. And their legacy lives on. But the new pirates are something else, because now they're techno-enabled pilots, pirates. And they have a completely different capability, not least in the cybersphere. Cyber, as you know, is growing exponentially. So the density of traffic now every day is greater than that every year only 10 years ago. And it's growing at this extraordinary pace. It's also penetrating all aspects of our lives. So we have some really interesting groups working in the Oxford Martin School in different dimensions of cyber. But amongst them, for example, are digestible or wearable or internalized cyber-enabled systems in your brain, in your body, etc. Of course, we'll be, you can open your bank accounts with cyber, but increasingly you'll open your front door locks and you'll have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, which will determine your distance from the vehicle in front of you, etc. And as cyber penetrates all aspects of our lives, trust, integrity, interdependency becomes more and more crucial. So we're entering into a world where we are cyber, cyber beings, increasingly. Our dependency on our mobile devices and increasingly on the interactions with others. Very difficult to imagine our lives now without the internet, our mobile devices, etc. How we'd operate. Many people no longer have fixed line phones, for example. Um, how would this operate? But as it becomes more and more central to everything we do as it becomes the nervous system of our lives and of the planet, 
trust integrity becomes more and more important. And there's a whole side conversation about who's in control. We've seen in the debate around Snowden, around privacy, this understanding that it unleashes whole new worlds of knowledge and interdependency where trust and integrity become important. Now, there's another debate which we don't have time to go into, I think, today. I'm happy to come back to the conversation around where is this going and do we live in a future world of privacy or not and do we want to? But trust and integrity are central. The broader point is that it's not the technological changes themselves which are going to be a question, but it's how we use them. It's whether we want them. It's whether we are able to manage them in a way where we feel in control. Whether we are able to have these systems without losing our lives to them, without losing control, control over everything. It's also very important to recognize that what societies feel about this matters centrally. So I'm always very struck by the fact, for example, that Germany has banned nuclear power, new nuclear power, and GMOs, whereas, say, USA and China embrace them. So the simple availability of technology doesn't tell you that you're going to use it. But when you get the internet and these powerfully driving technologies, if you decide to get off that particular connectivity, it will fundamentally shape not only your life but the future of your society and how it operates. So these interdependencies are physical increasingly, and this is simply the, the oil and gas, inter well, this is the gas interdependency, of course highlighting the significance of our interdependency with Russia uh, here, a whole other new systemic risk which comes out of this new age. Unimaginable in the pre-90 world, of course, that we'd be energy dependent on Russia. Um, physical interdependencies, but also <laughs> virtual. And the virtual ones are as complex and as systemically risky as the physical ones. Now, I mentioned previously this question of the adding up problem. Can we all make choices which are rational for ourselves, and where do they go? And this, again, and I discuss this in the book at some length, I believe is generating systemic risks out of globalization. Because the advances in globalization have meant, with this 3.5 billion new middle class consumers in China, 4 billion in the world, that increasingly what we used to think about as sustainable behavior is unsustainable. We've seen this very clearly in the North Atlantic cod. This was just Europe and North America getting rich, destroying the cod. And of course, it's rational, as we know, for each country to subsidize its fishing fleets, to give work to its fishermen, etc., to have cheap fish at home. But when you start getting into more and more of this, you get into natural resource depletion. Unfortunately, animals don't know how much they're worth, and nor does the planet, a tree, or a piece of ocean, or atmosphere. So there's no relationship between value or price and the availability of the resource, what economists think of as inelastic supply. So this poor tuna. Uh, so this is a tuna that was sold for, um, for a million pounds. Uh, in Tokyo. And this is the um, market's response to the scarcity of tuna. Uh, of course, uh, it means more and more high-tech fishing boats chasing the remaining tuna. Uh, so you just get very rapid extinction, uh, as you will get with rhino horn and anything else. The price goes up. But far from the price going up leading to less demand, it actually leads to more exploitation of the resource. Uh, and that is the story with all natural resources. They are not going to be managed uh, through markets. And because the driving force uh, of
of our planet on resource allocation is markets, uh, we get very rapid biodiversity, natural resource extinction. Well, the problem really is that governments are not very smart at this either. Uh, this is the Aral Sea, shared by six countries, each country doing the right thing, drawing water to feed their people, to irrigate their crops, collectively a disaster. So this tension between <coughs> rational individual, rational country behavior, and collective outcomes becomes more and more acute as we have more and more people and more and more pressure. What's rational for the England or the UK is not rational for the world. And the same applies to all other countries. Now we see, in the case of climate change, a very dramatic story around this. As economists are very aware of the very close relationship between economic growth and demand for fossil fuels. This is well documented, and it's through the rising incomes leading to higher purchases of vehicles, of microwaves, of fridges, of ovens, uh, of travel, etc. And these are all things that we think about as good. We want people all to have a fridge and an oven uh, and a computer and to be able to travel and to have transport. And yet we know that until you get to very high levels of income, these things have a very rapidly rising relationship. And the story of the time we live in is we're going through this peak period of transformation because of the rapid rise in incomes, and particularly from $1,000 to $10,000 per capita. Because it's at about $7,000 per capita that people tend to maximize their conversion of income, marginal income, into the consumption of planetary destroying things. Energy, fossil fuels, food, fish, etc. Once you reach higher levels of income, you can start tailing off. So now I eat whole grains, I ride my bicycle, etc. If it wasn't for my flying, I'd have a very low carbon footprint. But that takes a long way to get to. And it, for most of the world, still climbing very steeply the energy curve. So this is the reason why, when we look at this period in the long sweep of history, we see this story on methane and carbon dioxide emissions. And anyone that doesn't believe uh, that there's rapidly increasing greenhouse gases simply needs to look at this data set. Uh, and anyone that doesn't believe that that leads to climate change doesn't understand 19th century physics. Um, but this is the obvious question. This is the unintended spillover of our success, which is one dimension of it. And of course, the greatest systemic risk the planet faces is the re relationship between that and this, which is atmospheric warming. Uh, and here, the scientists are pretty unanimous that we're heading for at least two degrees warning. Now, this two degree number tends to um, often be misunderstood. That's an average for the planet. So that means that many places will go up by four or five or six <coughs> degrees. And of course, anyone that knows anything about <coughs> farming will know that averages don't matter. One minute of a temperature that's too high or of a hailstorm that's too big, or a wind that's too strong, uh, or a week late in a rain destroys you. And anyone that lives in a river valley will know that it doesn't matter what the average height of the river is if it comes down two meters too high for one hour of the year. Your house is washed away. Or if you live on the coast of Bangladesh, it doesn't matter what the average height of the water is, mm. is you get washed away in the months. So one of the things that's absolutely clear is that it's not only going to be much higher averages, but much more variability. And with that, all sorts of systemic risks. So we know what we've got to do. We've got to get off our carbon addiction. But we've taken 200 years of addiction uh, to get to where we are today, and this is going to require radical change. And particularly radical for us, because we can't say to the rest of the world, sorry, the atmosphere's full, 
uh, you just wait a few thousand years uh, before you climb the curve. So it's got to be urgent. Now the question of who is managing this is absolutely central as well to my concerns on the butterfly defect. As we've become more and more hyper-globalized as a global community with all the consequences that I identify in the book and some of which I've touched on in this lecture, the question is who is managing it? Is there some one that understands this? Is there some community of actors out there that are acting on this very obvious information that will safeguard our future? We have many institutions whose job it is to manage different aspects of globalization. Most of these were established after the Second World War. And indeed, the success of globalization in many ways is down to some of them. Their effectiveness in creating peace in the post-war environment. Their effectiveness in creating trade rules through the World Trade Organization, etc. So the system has been created by these institutions. Unfortunately, they are now totally unfit for purpose. We have 196 countries, again, that proliferation of countries, and we nearly got another one in Scotland. Uh, this proliferation of countries has been a post-war phenomenon. 100 more countries now than there were 100 years ago. More and more actors, more and more empowered, and, of course, a power transition. And in many ways, we should welcome this power transition because it's a reflection of new economic force. It's a reflection of the fact that the U.S. can no longer tell the world what to do. China, India, Brazil, many other countries are exercising their right and demanding a say in the future of the world. But we're going through a tussle. We're going through a power transition, a period in which no one is able to lead. They don't have the legitimacy. They don't have the domestic political support. They don't have the financial means. And, of course, they don't have the execution capability. They don't have the military. They don't have the financial muscle, etc. And so we're in a very, very dangerous period because at precisely this time in history when we need collective management, it's paralyzed. It's absolutely paralyzed. And if you spend as much of your time as I've been unfortunate enough to spend in international institutions, you get a sense of this, endless <coughs> conversations. There's halting progress, and it's important on reform of the institutions, on some areas, but it's not scaled to the urgency or pace of the problem. There are these new networks, and we can come back if you're interested in discussion as to whether they provide the answer. My view is they don't. They provide the capability of awareness. They provide a network effect. They create herding. They create capability to understand some of the issues. We know what we know about climate change because of the information available out there. But equally, they can lead to great complexity and overload. And they can also, as we've seen with ISIS and others and cyber attacks, be used as an immense force for destabilization. We need to urgently learn from the financial crisis. And the first, sorry, the, second, the first chapter of the book is about understanding complexity and systemic risk. The second chapter is about the financial crisis, and I think it's the most, you know, in terms of my thinking in the book, it's the one I really got as the wake-up call. I've spent my life in financial institutions, my adult working life. And as you might know, and many of you if you've been students, would have maybe applied for jobs at some of these places. The IMF Young Professional Program gets 10,000 applicants and takes 20 people. All of them have doctorates from good institutions. And all of them increasingly have work experience too. These are not stupid people. They're from good institutions and they're amongst the brightest from the good institution. The central banks of the world employ over, uh, over 200,000 people 
with PhDs. Their job is financial stability, national financial stability, and in the case of global institutions like the IMF and BIS, global financial stability. And we'll know from the UK, just up the road here, the Treasury, the Bank of England, these are the elite of our national system. They have the best data, they have the best people, they have the most power, and they also the most joined up. They all play golf together once a year in Jackson Hole. They all have each other's first names and their mobile numbers on their mobile phones. This is a small elite of people who are paid handsomely. So I take away, coming to the conclusion now, uh, a number of things from this financial crisis. The first is this extraordinary paradox of globalization, of a hyper-integrated system which leads to immense robustness and capability. And this is part of this diversity complexity story, but also has new characteristics of complexity and homogeneity, which are profoundly destabilizing. Everyone is in groupthink. Everyone has the same sort of economics degree, and they're not seeing the complexities. And when they are, attribution is extremely difficult. Many academics I would say there are about 40 books that have been written about the financial crisis, with each brilliant academic having a different theory about what caused the financial crisis. This is because this thing is very complex. Attribution, cause and effect, are difficult. <coughs> They're all right in some ways and wrong in some ways. But this problem, and this is a problem for politicians and governments and regulators, is where are the levers and how do you control them it becomes more and more difficult. And part of the problem is that we have this global system which is absolutely integrated and we have this national drive for national politics, national control, national regulators. And this tension becomes more and more acute. In all the systems, I'm using finance as an example. And of course, national governments do not want to lose control, so they don't empower the global institutions. I tell an anecdote in this book about Bob Rubin, who was the Treasury Secretary at the time, uh, not being aware when an IMF surveillance mission was being done in the US. Now, having been at the airport with the red carpet to meet the IMF surveillance mission when it came to South Africa, I know this is quite extraordinary. You treat them with respect, you give them what you need, and you listen to their answers, otherwise they cause big problems for you. But when the biggest player, the US, isn't even aware when it's happening, you get a sense of the inequality in power relationships. This is like a football game in which Suarez, when shown the red card, just keeps on biting and playing. Sorry, yeah. my apologies to the Suarez supporters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the reason football works as a game, and you can have an FA Cup with players in one team paid more than the whole rest of the team they're playing against, one player worth more than the whole rest of the team, is because the rules are respected by everyone. You're shown a red card, you get off the field. That's not how finance works. That's not how global governance works. That's not how power relationships work on cyber, finance, pandemics, or anything. The big players set their own rules and ignore what they don't want to play. And that's what happened in finance. And it certainly is one of the key causes of the financial crisis. So it's not just that we beat up on these institutions like the IMF and say, these idiots didn't see what was happening and couldn't solve the problem. Actually, they did see what was happening, but they had no power to influence those that were carrying on. The third lesson is that the technological changes are accelerating much more rapidly than our capabilities to understand or manage them. And part of the problem is that we're skilling our institutions, the civil service, the Bank of England, the Treasury, but also our health ministries and other ministries, with people who are basically civil servants who wouldn't know the difference between nanotechnology, quantum computers, 
uh, and credit derivatives uh, if it was in front of them. <coughs> and so you have these whiz kids coming out of university, like many of you, I'm sure, with great maths and physics and other degrees, running rings around old men like me that are in the regulators, uh, the audit committees and things. And I was on the audit committee of a major London-based financial institution just after the financial crisis. And the two things struck me. One is when the FSA, the financial regulator, came to see us, what it wanted to talk about was whether the small print on the back of the brochures that were in the bank branches was big enough for old ladies and men to see. This was two weeks before the financial crisis. That's what they wanted to talk about. And secondly, I didn't understand what was happening in our trading room when it blew up. And actually, it wasn't my job to understand it because I trusted the supervisors. But even if they'd explained it to me, I wouldn't have understood the new credit derivatives, what Warren Buffett called weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> These technological changes, and I've illustrated in DNA, I've illustrated in cyber and other areas, this pace of change overwhelms politicians and regulators' knowledge and capabilities in both the public and private sector. The fourth point is that we are mesmerized by the data, but we don't understand it. We are unable to really get a grip on it, and we are blinded by the blizzard of it. So this data deluge, how do we drink from the fire hydrant of information we get? And this has been compounded, I believe, by wasteful activities as even more data collection. In the U.S., the Frank Dodd Act, which in itself is a very strange response to a 33,000 pages of small print, regulatory small print in response to the financial crisis that will only enrich the lives of accountants and law firms but won't stop the next financial crisis. But this is one of the spin-offs has been to create this whole new data set where all financial transactions in the U.S. are going in something like $200 million of data expenditure a year. But this just means more data deluge. All the information that was needed to stop the financial crisis was at the hands of the Federal Reserve, the SEC, and Lehman Brothers. And so when you hear the testimony of Hank Paulson to the Congressional Committee into why they let it go, and he says, we did not understand what was happening, one has to think, hang on, you had 10,000 people with PhDs and all the data and you didn't understand what was happening. It's not too little data. <coughs> It's a failure to interpret and understand structural changes in the data that is behind all of this. So being blinded by this new blizzard is a problem. The fifth problem, which I'm not really going to have time to go into, is the short-termism, which is endemic in all parts of the system, in the politics and in the finance. Mark-to-market accounting, quarterly reporting, and increasing drive for short-term profits is pushing out resilience in the system. You cannot invest in working capital tied up, spare parts, spare capacity, whether you're in a public utility like an Oxford hospital that now has one day spare oxygen supplies where previously you've had two weeks because that's working capital tied up, or a car, manufacturer, car part manufacturer just supply chain driven with no spare parts, uh, just constant supply. This drives out resilience in the system. So we have this hyper-dispersed supply chain system where everyone is performing just in time, creating extreme brit brittle systems, very, very fragile systems. This is the suppliers for our iPhones. We are more and more interdependent in everything we do because the market is driving us to become so. So to buck the trend is difficult. This is, I've found a bit of a fun thing in the book. This is citations of the word lean management over time. Everyone with the same group think about lean. Lean is mean. Don't leave value on the table. So when you get a shock like an airline shock, everything stops immediately. No one can do anything. So what do we do? Just in conclusion, this is work which has been done with Andy Haldane at the Bank of England, who's one of the real best thinkers uh, in this area. Understanding complexity. This is information that was entirely available before the financial crisis. These panels are 19 
1985, uh, 95, and 2005, and it's the growth of different interdependencies of credit derivative trading. And it's very obvious what's going on here. You're getting this node becoming dominant. And when you pull the plug on that node, as they did when they pulled Lehman Brothers, this whole thing collapses. Competition policy, regulatory policy can stop this happening. Competition policy is not only about which bank is too big to fail, but think of geography as being an increasingly important driver. Think of Canary Wharf disappearing, or Wall Street disappearing for a week or two from our systems, and then think about robustness of systems. Geography, where, what matters. Can we manage this? I believe it's desperately important that we do. What we see in the politics of today, in the politics in the UK of the rise of national parties across Europe, is a romanticism about the past. Is a belief that globalization is too dangerous. There's a protectionism, a xenophobia, a belief we can put back the walls, disconnect. Return to some mythical past when we were able to control our futures more effectively. I believe this is profoundly misguided, but our failure to connect with our citizens is leading to this dramatic decline in interest in politics and turnouts. People are saying our politicians can't help us and there's no point in engaging. And they're right. Because increasingly our politicians are not able to shape our futures. Our futures will be determined what happens elsewhere. And so we need to have political systems which understand that we're bound up. We have integrated systems. If we disconnect, we disconnect from our futures. We trap ourselves in a past which is more dangerous, where not only are we not going to advance, but we're not going to control those forces which shape our future. Be they climate change, be they pandemics, be they cyber attacks, be they terror attacks. Whatever it is, it requires a joined up response. So my idea is that we need to be connected. But in being connected, we need to develop the systems which will ensure that we remain resilient. And much of the last chapter of the book is devoted to explaining how this can be done. Thank you very much. Thank you, <clears throat> Danny. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Pierre, and thank you, Ian, for an absolutely delightful lecture. Thank you, John and Jean-Pierre, for setting up this Systemic Risk Centre where we can have the space to talk about these issues in an interesting, no holds barred interdisciplinary way. Ian gave one of his usual, extremely erudite, completely convincing kind of public lectures. I had read many of his works before I met him. Uh, <clears throat> over the time that he had been working on globalization, I'd become interested in that as the next thing to do after we, were, after we fully understood macroeconomics. And then, of course, macroeconomics fell apart. Um, but I still think that it is through understanding the global economy that we will be able to come to grips with many of these important policy issues today. After what seems like decades of reading Ian's work, I finally got the opportunity to meet him. And actually, not in London, not in Oxford, not in Washington, D.C., but in Beijing, China, where we were talking about global governance and what the world had become. And because I had read so many of his works, I felt that I understood what he was going to say, but it was clear that, clear that the richness of our conversation as we were talking face to face <clears throat> was an easy flow of discussion, which I could not have gotten from simply reading his books. It is excellent that we have something like the SRC to get people like us all together to talk about these important issues, which we couldn't do otherwise. I think that this book is an important work 
and it contributes at many different levels. When I first read this over different drafts, I thought that uh, at least two levels became clear to me were really important for a typical reader to try and come to terms with. A first was just the collection of facts about the world. The collection, some of which were anecdotes, some of which were systematic statistical evidence, but all of which, when put together, provided a compelling picture of what the world looked like. And I thought this compelling picture was a much-needed antidote to a kind of rose-tinted cheerleading of what the information technology revolution and globalization had brought the world. When we look around and we see <clears throat> the writings of people like Farid Zakaria or Thomas Friedman, they consistently point out how the world is so much a safer place, so much a more prosperous place, so much a more secure and stable place than in the past. And indeed, those numbers are borne out. When we look at a number of black deaths, uh, human deaths, when we look at you know, what happened during the Spanish flu uh, epidemic, when we look at the number of people killed during the First World War, the things that we see around us in sheer numbers are dwarfed by these, these terrible events. But nonetheless, almost all of us in the world feel a terrible malaise about the way the world is going. And for this, if you just look at the raw numbers without the kind of interpretation that Ian has given us, it escapes us why the world is so much a, a less secure place, why we need to think harder about the issues that, he shows, that, that show up here. And what, that's the first level that I think is really important to understand the book. So those of you who come buy the book afterwards, as I did, fill up pages and pages of notebook with taking notes on the examples that the authors have brought to us. The second level that I think is hugely important is an analytical, theoretical construction that they put together, which Ian got to towards the end of the lecture, but because of time he didn't spend as much, didn't put as much space to. Okay. This analytical structure is critical for the thinking because it says that the things that we were used to characterizing probability of incidents, understanding risks of failure in isolated parts of the world, all of that, the things that we document in a Zakaria, Friedman type of way, all of that is actually small potatoes. Because what really matters are not these variances that we've underestimated or tail probabilities that we don't completely understand, but the systemic spillover and contagion that lead from one part of the world to the next lead from one crisis that then blows up in people's faces. And that is the real danger. So when you unpack that, the book then provides you a clean and beautiful analytical structure to think about what goes on in the world. That structure comes in four pieces. The first is to agree with the Zakaria, Friedman, and all type of, of analysis that globalization and information technology-driven hyper-connectivity have brought benefits untold to the world. They leverage all the things we know about from economics. There is Ricardian comparative advantage. There is building of global supply chains. There is the employment of information technology for just-in-time production. All of this raising many-fold the efficiency with which humans can make things that are valued by the rest of humanity. This is a boon. The world has become completely different. The death of distance because of information technology means the world is more divided by time zones than it is by physical distance. The raised productivity has brought untold benefits to hundreds of millions of people, lifting them out of poverty. The interconnection that we've been able to leverage in the global supply chain have brought, in turn, hundreds of millions of people in India, in China, in Vietnam, not just to engage with the global economy, but out of the deepest poverty. On all of that is a good thing. But then we come to the remaining three points. The second point in the book 
is that these same factors that have brought us untold benefits have also heightened danger in the world, not necessarily from risk and tail probabilities and variances changing, but from the connectivity that builds contagion, increases the speed of transmission, and multiplies manifold the scale of disaster. And it is this perception that the world has changed that makes all of us so insecure, that looking at just the raw numbers does not communicate how the world has destabilized. And you have to look at the rich panoply of examples that's in the book to get a full appreciation of the subtlety of this argument. The third plank is two-edged. It says that all of these changes in the world have given individuals more power. And that's what Ian refers to when he says it's no longer state upon state that we need to worry about for wholesale destruction. But individuals can inflict that. And we've seen that happen over and over in the last few decades. Last few decades have seen very bad people inflict considerable harm on innocent thousands of, thousands of innocent people. It is that that makes us insecure. It is not one state fighting another. But here's the sting in the tail of the argument in the book. You actually don't even need just bad people to inflict this harm. You can have good, well-intentioned people working entirely within the system that can produce this carnage. We see this in the financial crisis. The way that the language is described in the book, the change in the world has given individuals more power, but it's lessened attribution, acknowledgement, and accountability. And that, for analytical economists, sets of alarm bells in our heads. Because what that means is that we've separated reward and incentive from action. And when people find that diffuse, they undertake actions that they don't fully appreciate. Nick Leeson thought that he was trying to do a good thing, doubling the bet each time, but then eventually brought down bearings. He wasn't Osama bin Laden trying to kill thousands of people. He was trying to do a good thing. Lots and lots more, we will see this kind of thing happen. Okay, so state upon state is no longer the critical point. Then finally, and here is the killer punch, I think is in the book. It is not the right solution to try and shut down all of these changes. These changes have brought both good and bad. And what we need to do is to manage the risks, not try and eradicate them. And to manage the risks takes a whole level of of thinking, a whole new level of training. We need people thinking about systemic risk, as the SRC will be doing. We need people to get away from traditional ways of thinking about risk, to be able to think about things in a systemic way. Complexity theory, which Ian's Martin School is taking the lead on in the UK, is an important weapon in our analysis of these things. Complexity theory tells us that no matter how well you understand the ingredients and components of the system, there will still be something at the aggregate macro level that will surprise you. Technically, the mathematicians that we know think about this as the theory of emergence. There are things that emerge that you will never be able to predict from studying the representative agent that populates your hypothetical system. And it's trying to think about this emergence that we need to take this forwards. Now, if you start my time, we want Q&A. But if I may spend 30 seconds undermining a little bit what I just said. Because I think just as we want to buy into this vision that Ian has told us, and I am firmly subscribed to it, I think we also want to always be a little bit cautious. That's, in fact, one of the messages. That just as you buy into other, how other people think, when you all think it's right, let's be a little bit cautious. So here's my little bit of caution. Okay. It is not the case that all intricately interconnected systems end up being fragile, because it's fragility that we're worried about. Jean-Pierre, in our discussion before we came in, talked about how diversity could be a way to ameliorate the risk from this.
But also think biology and evolution tells us that interconnected systems can be built to be robust. Our DNA is a hugely interconnected system. It has 90% redundancy built in, if not more. Our brains are incredibly intricate interconnected systems, hyperconnected. But you can carve out chunks of our brain, you can be involved in a dramatic accident, and our brain is able to function. We can still continue. Okay, maybe we can't be brilliant book writers, but we can still be relatively healthy people. Our brains, our biologies are relatively robust, and we don't want to throw those out. As you build your systems for managing risk in a hyperconnected world, I urge us to remember that hyperconnectivity can also build robustness. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. Uh, if you stick your hand up and you tell us who you are and ask a question and not to comment on whether you believe globalization is good or bad, but something <laughs> relevant to today's lecture, please. Gentlemen in the white shirt. Thank you. David Wood, Chair of London Futurists. Professor Golden, your talk was very strong on pointing out the problems and issues, and for various reasons you only hinted very quickly about the solutions, but I think many of us in the audience would really like to know what is the, the grounds for the, the possibilities for the solutions you've got in mind. Of course, we'd love to read them in your book, but maybe you can give us a few hints. Do you want the questions now, or do you want to take all the questions? It's up to you. Okay, please. Sure. That, that, that's a big question. Uh, first, Danny, thank you very much for your very, very kind comments. And, and a point at the end, if I might just pick up on that, um, which, which I think is absolutely right. Uh, it's actually some, one of the solutions um, that I do talk about in the final chapter is uh, not only learning from complex natural systems, uh, but also how uh, these interdependencies are managed. And of course, Bob May, who's the chair of um, this risk center at LSE, and others have written um, extensively about this. Um, diversity is very important for that. Uh, and the lack of homogeneity. And one of the things that worries me and one of the ways I think we can sustain systems uh, better is to have more diversity. And this is, applies within individual countries, which is one of the reasons another book I wrote, Exceptional People, talks about the role of migrants in dynamism and robustness of societies. It's true of corporate boards where diversity, gender, and other, uh, and teams have been shown to be more robust and resilient. Uh, but it's also true at the global level uh, with more, more interactions. Um, so th there's, a, there's a huge literature on that. Now, the ubiquitous MBA with everyone doing a Harvard case studies uh, and 1.5 million of them around the world at the same time uh, is the opposite of that effect. Everyone is run, using the same workbooks to run their companies and their supply chains uh, and driving out uh, that, that potential. So one, one sort of segueing on to, to respond, one, one of the, the issues I deal with is, is that. The second is a broad point which, which Danny also um, noted, which is that I'm, we, I don't advocate, and by the way, this book is co-written with Mike Mariatheson, who was my research assistant to postdoc uh, at Oxford, so you'll see his name uh, on the cover. Uh, we, don't, we didn't um, uh, advocate uh, anything to do with trying to close down globalization or integration, partly because of this point about diversity and integration, but also because we think uh, it's vitally important for the poor of the world uh, to still be integrated. However, managing this uh, is important, and there, there's a whole series of issues around the reform of global governance. I'm increasingly convinced that that's utopian uh, in, its biggest, in the biggest sense, uh, to expect the UN or anyone to save the world, although I believe in it strongly. Um, I wouldn't rely on it. Um, so I'm into a world of coalitions of the working, uh, of uh, like-minded actors who are prepared to be first movers and uh, make advances uh, in dealing with climate change or pandemics or cyber or other areas. Now, 
One has to be extremely careful about this, and I'm, I'm mindful of the time. I don't want to go into a whole other lecture. We know from Iraq the very clear dangers of coalitions of the willing. You have to have both the affected as well as the affecting being part of any story. Some things like finance, like climate change, could be dealt with by a very small number of actors. Twenty con- sorry, a dozen countries account for over 90% of carbon emissions. Why do you need 192 countries to agree to anything? Actually, New York emits more carbon than the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. So on that, key actors become very important. The same is true, by the way, of antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance. Very small numbers of players, pharmaceuticals, account for a very large part of the problem. Other issues, like pandemics, do actually require all countries and all actors in the world to be part of. So understanding this variable geometry of the risk, of who the actors are and how you affect solutions becomes important. Attribution, accountability, transparency. There's a story around that which is vitally important. Incentives, I'm a strong believer in signaling. Inequality and capture, I believe that our systems are are heavily unstable because of lobbying power, where you need $10 million to pass a bill in the U.S. Congress, at least, uh, where the coal lobby spends 100 times more than the climate, uh, anti-climate change lobby. You have a system which is profoundly anti-risk management. Um, so ensuring that there's not capture and that inequality does not breed capture through all sorts of means is another theme. So these are maybe just, I've said enough, some of the themes that I pick up on. Thanks, Ian. Any more questions? Gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. One well, stimulating conversation. Something about just population growth. We usually do accept that population is going up, and that's a problem. But um, if I'm right, uh, so Italy, Germany, and Japan are worried about the precise opposite: the uh, decline in births. And I, Russia was worrying about it. If I'm right, Putin's policies have reversed that. But uh, some people are beginning to worry about the very opposite. Could you just say something about that? Is that yep. a real issue? Well, thank you for that, because that's a plug for the other book I brought out last year, <laughs> at the end of last year, called Is the Planet Full? Um, which is an edited volume, which Oxford University published, this one's Princeton, um, which is on that question. And it's got uh, chapters by demographers, by climate scientists, by uh, health specialists and others really asking that question. And the most surprising thing, I think, is the pace in which fertility is collapsing. Um, the other thing which is just too t- the other takeaway from that book is that actually it's not about numbers at all. And, I, and the points I've already illustrated about New York having more carbon emissions or more antibiotic use than the whole of sub-Saharan Africa is illustrative of that. It's about what people are doing uh, and what choices they make uh, that's going to affect the stability of the planet. Any more questions? Young lady. Hello. Hi. Um, it's a question uh, directed to both of you. Um, you talked a lot about not wanting to shut down the pathways of globalization. And traditionally, this has been done through uh, shutting down trade agreements and protectionism. Um, I just wanted to know what you two thought about the way that trade negotiations were heading at the moment and the building momentum uh, that they were gaining, and specifically TTIP, what you thought about that. Danny, why don't you take that one? <laughs> <laughs> okay, just very quickly. Um, I, I, trade is the wonderful engine of growth. It has been for the last hundred, hundreds of years. It runs the risk of being derailed right now because of fears of these changes in the structure of global power. I think that trade policy is now being run by politics rather than by economics, and I think that's a disaster. Um, I, can, I can't do anything other than agree with Danny, other than to say I, I think trade's always been very, very political. Uh, anyone that looks at the agricultural subsidies yeah. uh, or the energy subsidies, uh, etc., um, will understand that it's been captured by politics, I think, f- f- over a very long period of time. Um, but um, I, I believe uh, in level playing fields. 
and that's because I think that if you want to support different groups in your society, um, there are smarter ways to do it than through distorting trade. Mm-hmm. And that's through income support or through farmer support or whatever else. Um, and the danger is that trade becomes a protectionist barrier which holds out old interests against new interests. And that's what we see in all the trade protectionist debates. It's very difficult to point to any trade protectionist measures that don't protect vested interests. Um, and, of course, some trade is extremely bad, like uh, trade in uh, child labor, in weapons, um, in certain drugs, etc. So I'm not suggesting all trade is good. And indeed, on the issue of complexity and resilience, a point I make in the book is that there are some complex systems you actually want to be fragile and collapse, um, like weapons, illegal weapons trade, for example. But um, most trade uh, is broadly society beneficial, and poorest people pay the most for protectionism. There's a lot of data on this. Poor people in the UK would be at least a thousand pounds better off without crazy EU agricultural protectionism, for example, because they consume a higher share of high, high-priced food. Let me, gentlemen at the back. <coughs> Uh, thank you. Um, is what you're describing, do you think that the, the democracies uh, as national democracies and the market as a factor of progress and exchange tool uh, for, for the different people, countries, corporations, is it just not the right system for this globalization? You know, like... Is it something of the past? Do we need to find new ways of managing these resources and and evolve? Yeah. Um, That's a huge question. (laughs) Um, And uh, I think it is the case that our democracies are having great difficulty in coping with hyper-integration. And the fact that we're running at the nation state, our politics, but actually the forces that shape our future are not going to be at the nation state level. Uh, And that tension is widening, uh, which makes us more and more frustrated with our democracies and more and more short term in in, in the promises that that our elected leaders have. It's also the case that if one looks around the world, it is the case, I think, that Singapore and China are doing a much better job at managing globalization. Now, there's a lot of countries, uh, of which Russia might be one and many others, which are already doing a terrible job of it, uh, who uh, might or might not be democracy, depending on how you define them. So it's, but, but clearly there's a, there's, a, there's a major challenge around democracy, and the same is true, certainly, of the market economy, uh, because prices are not going to determine uh, sustainable outcomes without heavy pricing of unintended spillovers, be they carbon uh, or or antibiotic resistance or whatever. So regulation is going to have to be increasingly accepted or non-market carbon taxes or whatever as a part of our future if we want to live collectively in a sustainable way. And that, so there's a real tension there. I don't believe we can throw out either democracy or the market, but I believe we're going to have to evolve both of those uh, much more actively uh, and rapidly. Let me take one more question. Con, why don't you go? It's a, it's a very short question. I, I just wondered if your enthusiasm for three trade extended to free capital flows. Um, no, <laughs> uh, uh, it doesn't. Um, there's a lot of evidence from the financial crisis. Did everyone hear the question, does my enthusiasm for free trade extend to free capital flows? Um, the answer is no. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that those countries that had various forms of capital control did much better uh, in the financial crisis. Um, the question is how much, over what time do they liberalize uh, and what, what is the extent of intervention? Uh, obviously, uh, South Africa is one example. Uh, China is another example, which has been widely cited, and there are a number of others. But I don't believe in countries being 
not, not having free capital over time. So there's a transition period. Uh, there's all sorts of measures and institutions that have to be in place in order to have free capital movements. Uh, and I will just uh, be able to avoid the question of the future of the Eurozone um, <laughs> and free capital movement across Europe, uh, but uh, entice you enough, I hope, uh, to say that I think it is sustainable with the free capital movement across Europe. Uh, but clearly, uh, that, watch that space. <laughs> Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. As housekeeping, I'd like to remind you that if you would like to purchase a book, it's just outside here. Ian will sign the box. It's a unique opportunity to have a very valuable signature that will raise the value by five hundred pounds in one go. Oh, yeah. And I would like to thank Ian and Danny for participating and all of you for being here. It was fantastic. Thank you.